right, guys, welcome to another episode of Side Quest Podcast, the unofficial podcast of Fitocracy. If you are not following me on Twitter, check me out at SideQuest FM. You can also follow me on Instagram as well at SideQuest FM. You can head over to Facebook and like the podcast there at SideQuest Podcast. You get updates every Monday on when new episodes come out, or head over to iTunes, hit subscribe, and every Monday at 6 a.m., it'll come straight to your iPhone. While you're there, leave a review. When you leave a review, it helps us move up the charts so more people can hear from the amazing guests that I have each and every week. You can also head over to the website at sidequestfitness.com backslash podcast and listen to every episode there as well, as well as peruse articles that I've put up uh, as, as well. Uh, I have a great guest for you today. This is take two because Google decided to be a little crazy. Uh, so anyways, here we go. Uh, he has written for T-Nation, bodybuilding.com, men's health, stack magazine, women's health, live strong, and many, many, many more. Uh, he is the number one man over at Cressy Sports Performance in Boston. Uh, and he is the go-to source I go to when I need to know information on anything to do with shoulders, uh, mobility, or deadlifting. Uh, the one and the only Tony Gentlecore. Tony, welcome to the show. What's up, Rob? Take two. Let's do this. All right, let's do it on take two. <laughs> uh, so I know a little bit about you. For people who don't, we'll briefly go through this again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but tell me a little, a little about your story. Well, um, your initial introduction was so great that we, we talked about Star Wars nerd. and you know, <laughs> So um, as you can see, I got a Star Wars poster in the back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of reiterate before, um, you know, I'm originally from uh, central New York, Finger Lakes region, middle of nowhere. Um, I played baseball through high school, was lucky enough to be able to play in college in New York and in Pennsylvania. And... Um, you know, when I graduated, I graduated with a degree in health education and thought that my it would be way cooler to spend my days in a gym than wearing a tie every day and having to wear dress pants and all that stuff, matching belts and shoes. Like, that's just lame. Um, so I um, started off in corporate fitness back in 2002. So along with corporate fitness, I was also a commercial gym personal trainer um, for a, for quite a few years, five, six years. Um you know, I hooked up with Eric Cressy back in, uh, let's see, summer 2005. I uh, moved out to New England. He and I roomed together for about two years, um, which was interesting. <laughs> uh, um, no, believe me, Eric and I are best friends. And um, certainly uh, he rubbed off on me in, in a lot of ways and seeing his work ethic in person. And um, obviously, you know, he and I and Pete Dupuy opened up Cressy Sports Performance in 2007. And, um, yeah, I think you'd be hard-pressed to name uh, um, a, a top 10 list of legit, um, well-respected training facilities and, and not have our name come up. So, you know, we're very proud of that. And, um, you know, we're known as training overhead athletes, in particular baseball players. But, um, you know, we, we do train. You name a sport, we've trained them. So football, soccer, basketball, swimmers, tennis, um, you know, we've worked with a, a, a wide array of athletes, and, and not only that, we train a fair share of general fitness population clientele as well, both male and female. So um, a lot of people come to us, they might read something from Eric or something from myself or something from the, from the other staff, staff members, and, um, you know, shoulder issues, back issues, knee issues, we've seen it all. You know, we, we like to look at people's movement, assess, write their programs, get them um, moving in the right direction, get them stronger. Um, and hopefully cool things happen. So um, it's cool because no no two days are the same, Yeah. Um, which definitely helps me. Not that I would ever um, disregard my background as a commercial gym trainer because, you know, I, I often tell young upcoming trainers that one of the best things they can do is to spend a year or two or three in a commercial gym setting. Um, just cause I feel like that's a way to grow and a way to, uh, expose yourself to a, a wide array of people. Cause you know, part of being a personal trainer and being successful in this industry is being a people person. It isn't really all about your smarts and, um, being a great coach, which absolutely helps. But, um, you know, I learned a lot as a personal trainer, but certainly it gets, let's be honest, it gets a little bit monotonous at times when you're putting in 10 hour days, training people one-on-one, -on -one. um, so yeah, you know, I we 
you know, our, our, our model at Crusty Sports Performance is one that not a lot of facilities do. A lot of facilities try to emulate. And, um, no, it's awesome. I, I have a blast. I, I get to wear sweatpants to work every day. So um, <laughs> and I get to listen to I put my, my EDM on that most people like, some people don't, but it's my facility. So you listen to my music. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like the sweatpants. I, I thought about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Growing up as a kid, that's all I would ever wear because my mom, there was a accident with jeans once when I was like four. Yeah. And I was like, no, nothing with zippers. And I started to realize <laughs> Maybe my mom had me set up for like a personal trainer kind of like lifestyle, and then like I enjoy. I did nothing but wear sweatpants for five years. Yeah, oh, I just like it's shorts and sweatpants. So we're, this is the season where it's shorts, but uh, um, but yeah, it, it, it doesn't suck. So it's uh, <laughs> it, make, it makes getting ready for work in the morning fairly easy. <laughs> cool. Well, so in in reading about your about me section, uh, you know, you were an active kid, and you mentioned that you you've played every sport imaginable. Uh, and I know you always coach and, and preach a lot of times that, you know, young athletes should play as many sports as possible yeah. because they're going to learn from basketball. They're going to learn from baseball. They're going to have those different movements that each sport, you know, uh, encompasses. And, and, and I have to agree. I, I played soccer in the spring to baseball in the summer to soccer in the fall to basketball, then back to soccer. And it all overlapped. Um, I don't know if any of it really ever worked for me because I was kind of the fat, lazy kid. So I was like, I'll play goalie. I'll just stand back here. Oh, you're going to put me on the bench in basketball? All right. Uh, but but I got to ask, you even mentioned bowling. So is your bowling oh, yeah. still strong? Let me let me, let me me tell you, I was a, quite the hit of the ladies that I was a bowler back in the day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have my own ball. I have my own pair of shoes. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, there wasn't much to do where, where, where I'm from. Yeah. Um, and this is pre-internet internet era. Um, you know, and bowling me, I was, I was in the league in high school, all through high school, every Sunday, every Saturday or, and or Sunday. Um, it was league play, tournaments. Um, and I'm not talking lane candlestick bowling that they do here in New England. That's lane. I'm talking about real bowling. Um, but, yeah, I had my own ball. Um, and I, I, that was the type of sport that, you, I mean, I say sport. <laughs> um, it's competitive, but, you know, you look at the professional bowling tour and they, they don't look like uh, fantastic athletes. But um, so, so if we were going to recast Mystery Man in the fitness industry, you would, you would be the bowler. Yes, I would be the bowler. <laughs> I, don't, I don't play nearly as much now. Like, I'm, I'm, it's like every handful of years that I actually get to a bowling alley. I was pretty good, though. I had a 190 average. Um, that might be the highest I've ever scored, and that yeah, was – No, I was, I was pretty good. Um, I mean, I was lame. I, I used to watch the professional bowling tour on TV um, just because, like, in my, my parents' house, we had, like, four channels anyways. Yeah. So um, it was either that or watching fishing. And uh, <laughs> so I watched – I don't never understood that. Why was ESPN like let's let's put a camera on a guy as he fishes? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't even have ESPN. So, oh, wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, bowling. I I played. I mean, I was outdoors all the time as a kid. Like, which in hindsight was great because I look I look back at how much Kool Aid I drank back in the day. <laughs> the pure amount of sugar I drank. Literally, like I would make a thing of Kool Aid every day, and that's like a cup of sugar. Oh yeah, every day. Yeah. Um, so, but I was outside. I mean, I was, I mean, my wedding was three weeks ago and listening to my sister talk, she explained the story of like me in the, in the side yard, like hitting a baseball back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, you know, I did that all summer, all the time. So, um, you know, I attributed that to my athletic success, um, going forward as far as baseball. And that, that is something that when we get parents coming in with their, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old kids, um, we stress upon them. Like we always ask like, Hey, what sports do you play? Um, and unfortunately a lot of them say baseball. And then like, that's it at 13. Yeah. Um, they're playing spring ball, two summer league, summer league teams, fall ball. Um, you know, and yeah, I, I understand that the kids love baseball and I love baseball at that age. And I wanted to play baseball. Um, but I got to tell you, they're missing out on a lot of motor learning skills, mm -hmm. um, not to mention the overuse patterns. And, you know, I mean, people are a little bit more cognizant of arm wear and tear now and high pitch counts and, and stuff like that with regards to youth athletics, in particular baseball. So that's 
that's becoming more of a, of a talking point. But still, there, there's a lot of young, youngish kids that are misused um, in, the, in the context of baseball and where they're – not only that, but they're playing it year-round. And, um, you know, I, I think that's unfortunate because I feel like they, they, they disallow themselves to marinate into, in, a, in an athletic right. uh, environment where they're able to adapt and, and acquire different skills. So um, that's definitely an issue in the industry. Yeah, and well, and so much of, of every sport. I mean, it, soccer, baseball, basketball, even even football. Though my mom wouldn't let me play that. Uh, you know, they they have a lot of the same movement patterns, but there's different movement patterns that they focus on. So it's going to kind of, you know, strengthen areas that maybe baseball didn't. Because if you're in the outfield, you might be standing around a lot, but you're still going to be. Yeah, I mean, baseball. When you think about it, there's there's not a lot going. There's a lot of downtime. Right. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's funny because, like, you know, parents come in and be like, hey, I want my kid to get faster and conditioned and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they talk about all these long runs they do. And, you know, you know, Eric and I and the rest of the staff have been adamant that, you know, you know, long distance aerobic work for baseball players really doesn't have a place. I mean, they're, the, the longest distance they're running is 90 feet. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not really – I mean, as much as we do sprint work, um, we're not concerned about top speed – Right, because like a baseball player never reaches top speed. It's all about acceleration and you know a little bit of change of direction. But um, you know, yeah, it's it, it's not a, a overly active sport. So when we're dealing with a pitcher or a catcher or a shortstop, you know, there's a lot of downtime between pitches and in between innings and stuff like that. And you know, whereas you look at a basketball game or a soccer game where it's stop, go, change of direction, sprint, yeah. walk, kick. Um, you know, there, there's a lot more going on. And, and that's the type of stuff that a lot of young baseball players miss out on when they only play baseball year round. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Um, I, even though I did sit on the bench quite a bit, I, I think it helped me uh, be a little more active uh, yeah. and be able to move a little bit, at, at least for basketball, because that's what I love the most. Yeah. Um, well, you there's know, camaraderie. I mean, even when you're part of a team, there, there's a camaraderie and, but right, like the team think that yeah. you're a part of, you know. So I mean, you're going to practice, you're involved in the game. I mean, there, there's a lot more involved than just being on the court. So right, um, right, and, that, and it, it grows people. As you know, then this whole discussion about entitlement um, in youth athletics, like everyone gets a trophy and everyone plays equal time, and you know, um, I can't say I agree with that. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've had an incident in, in the Massachusetts area with a, a very highly respected high school baseball coach that we know very well who was fired. Um, you know, no one knows the true 100% side of the story, but it seems that, you know, there's, there's, there's unfortunately a lot of entitlement in youth, youth athletics and, you know, this, uh, this, this plastic bubble that we got to protect our children and, and protect their feelings. And, you know, to me, like kids nowadays – lack a lot of resiliency mm -hmm. um you know we need they need to learn how to fail because i mean i wrote a blog post the other day on like how failing and learning to fail well um can be a good thing i mean that's really the only way you're going to get better at anything whether we're talking sports whether we're talking your your fat loss goals right. whether we're talking your job whether we're talking being a parent i mean how many parents do you know like it was like trial and error with their first kid. Like I don't have a kid, but but then they come along their their second kid. It's all the piece of cake. Like it was nothing. I mean, you hear it all the time. I mean, there's failing and failing well is a way to build resiliency. And you know, there's a, in youth athletics. You know, I can't say that I agree with this whole everyone gets a trophy and uh, everyone deserves uh, equal playing time. Um, I think to a degree that that comes like when we're talking little league and t-ball and you know, maybe up to a certain point that that comes into into play. But when you start talking high level athletics, mm -hmm. um, you know, it. Not to say that it's all about winning because it's not, but it kind of is. <laughs> um, I mean, you're competing for a reason. You're not competing to just be like, "Hey, I'm competing just to compete." You know, like, going back to the 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 story I said about the the high school baseball coach here in Massachusetts, it's like when you're competing at a level where you're playing Division One high school baseball, that's a very high level of baseball. Right. And I'm sorry, but if your kid can't catch a baseball, um, you know, they're not going to play as much. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
you know, and yeah, I mean, so yeah, outside, I mean, athletics is athletics, but certainly being part of a team, it allows you to learn to fail and fail well and, you know, build resiliency. So there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of growth that can happen from being part of a team and being involved with athletics in general. Yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful that my dad taught me this one lesson. And, and sometimes it's kind of like, it, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, but it's actually something that I, I, I'm very proud that I still sure. do. And, and he told me, you know, he's like, look, don't ever think that you're God's gift to basketball because there's always going to be someone who's better than you. Sure. And you have to work harder to be as good as they are. Yeah. And, and I've kind of taken that and everything. And, and, I, and I hate seeing, you know, a lot of this, oh, equal time, equal time. But yeah, if they're five or six, fine. You know, I understand. Let them kind of learn the game. They can't learn the game and learn how to play if they're sitting on the bench. But as you get older, you know, like we, we, we've lost our competitive edge in so many ways, um, you know, and, and I think we just kind of have to build that back in. Um, but all right, so, so a couple questions to start off. Sure. Um, so as a coach, what book has influenced you the most? Um, been the most influential? Well, you know, there's, there's quite a few. Like if I, if I were to take this computer and kind of walk out this door and to the left, I have this, I mean, there's a bookshelf here too, but, um, you know, I, you know, I, as much as I read about training and program design and, you know, assessment protocols and stuff like that, I do read a lot of, um, personal development, um, behavioral economics, um, stuff like that. Right. Um, so, you know, going back to our discussion from you know two minutes ago on failing, um, there's one book by Megan McArdle that I read uh, last year called The Upside of Down, which is all about failing and learning how to fail well, and it discusses like you know really the only way you're going to get better is by failing. Um, so how how you approach that process is really going to dictate in the long run your level of success um, in anything. Um, you know, the, the Power of Habit is a, right. is a book that comes to mind that, because um, that, when you think about it, as fitness professionals, part of our job is helping our clients and athletes to develop new habits that are going to help them attain their goal. Right. Because, um, I, mean, I mean, we could talk about nutrition, for example. Because um, it's the easiest. <laughs> Most people understand and have the knowledge base to know that going home and eating a half quart of Ben and Jerry's isn't going to help them lose weight. Um, but it's so tasty. Eating a bag of, I mean, people know what, what's good food and what's bad food. And, right. You know, yeah, we can get in the whole total calories in, calories out debate. Of course, of course right. Um, but so most people know what foods they should be eating rather than it's like the give or take. Um, and so it's not for most people, most of the time, it's not a knowledge issue, right? It isn't that fact that they, they don't know the stuff. It's like, they don't have the habits or the systems in place to, to implement those changes in the first place. So, you know, a book like the power of habit gives you as a fitness professional, um, ammunition or information to implement strategies that you can use with your clients and athletes to get them to okay, what, what can we do to help you get to this goal a little bit quicker? Right. Um, you know, those type of books, I mean, have a profound effect on how I, how I operate as a coach. You know, I can think of other authors like uh, Chip and Dan Heath, yeah. who've written books like Decisive and um, uh, uh, I'm alluding at the moment, but they've, they've written three or four very good books. That I've read all of them. They're so good that I don't remember the titles at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh switch is another book they wrote they, they read uh, uh i think made to stick is another book that they that they've they've written um so books like that so um i kind of use a one-to-one -one ratio as far as the books i read so if i'm reading a book by dan john or great cook or whatever on program design assessment training i'm also reading a book on personal development, behavioral economics. And I, and honestly, like I, I read fiction, I read nonfiction. Um, yeah, no, you're, re you're really excited for the Martian movie. Oh my God. That book was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I might, I, I'll, I'll have to pick it up now, now that I know. That book is really good. You should definitely read the okay. book. Um, before before the movie. movie. Um, cause that book was written by a guy who like, it's based off real science. Yeah. Like, 
like the stuff could really happen. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, as someone who does a fair share of writing, um, you know, I think I become a better writer when I'm reading other writing. Um, you know, I think any, any writer would say that a lot of their inspiration is by trying to emulate writers that they, they respect. You know, yeah. I can look at people in the fitness industry who I think are uh, fabulous writers like Dan John, John Romanello, um, you know, Eric, you know, guys, guys who are very good writers. Um, but then also looking at people like Stephen King and, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, um, all these other people. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, and there is a, a, a section on my website where I, I label like all these resources that I, I'm a big fan of. So I try to update it as much as possible as far as the books I've read and DVDs I've watched that have helped me become a better fitness professional. So I would encourage anyone to listen or watch or whatever to, to seek that on my website. But I was to give you an idea of the type of books that I, I've read in the past or that I read that, that helped me quite a bit. Yeah, I you know it's it's uh, I went on another podcast uh, and uh, th the guy who was hosting it asked me you know where do you get inspiration for like when you write and I told him I kind of do it the same way like I did with theater like I just take everything like when I w if I was acting in a play you know like my inspiration could come from just sitting in you know the mall and listening to a mother and their kid talk and like yeah. trying to understand you know the subtle differences of of, of what they're really saying. Um, but yeah, you know, getting, I think so many times everyone thinks we're supposed to do nothing but read fitness. Uh, John and John Goodman, uh, you know, at the personal trainer development center, he's like, always have a business book and always have, you know, a fitness book. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better at reading myself because I, I don't do it very often. Um, but I, I, I force myself to sit down and start 30 minutes a day. Yeah. And then you have, and then you have some people in the industry that all they do is read. Yeah. Um, they're, they're very well read, but they don't, they don't practice what they read. They don't implement what they read. So right. and that's kind of like the double edged sword of the internet. Yeah. You know, the internet, as much as it's a, a profound abyss of information, um, is also a, a place where people get caught in minutia, um, and arguing over semantics and, <laughs> talking about, oh, this is what you should do to train this person in this situation, but yet they don't train people in real life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't tell you how many times that, you know, we've had coaches or interns come in who have read super training and starting strength and all these phenomenal books that I think anyone should read who are in the industry, but are deer in headlights when you ask them to fix somebody's deadlift technique. Yeah. Like they don't know how to do it. So, yeah. um, you know, there, there's, there's, you need to actually practice what you preach too. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and far be it for me to, to disregard someone who's making a living solely on the internet. Like I can't, I mean, if they're, if they're making it work, they're paying their bills, they're making money, you know, awesome. Um, but for me, like, I still feel it's important to be able to say that, Hey, yeah, I'm still at the facility 30 hours a week coaching people. Yeah. Um, on top of what I do for my website and my blog and all the other writing responsibilities that I have. So, um, you know, you, you need to read, yes, but you also need to actually practice. put it to actual practice. Right, right. <laughs> all right, so that conversation led into to, to like three of the questions that I had. Okay. Uh, speaking of deadlifts, I have to ask because I don't know where you came up with this cue, but it makes so much sense. And anytime I like get heavier in weight, I have to like give myself this cue to activate my lats just to make sure I'm I'm doing everything properly. Where did the orange in the armpit squeeze in it to make oh, boy, that? I actually stole that from Dean Somerset. Um, oh, you know, okay. he and I, as you may or may not know, we do a lot of workshops together, yeah. <laughs> and we're we're cranking that up at the end of this summer into fall, but. Uh, um, that's one I actually stole from him, which obviously is brilliant. Um, one I've used in the past is like shoulder blades in your back pocket, yeah. you know, just to kind of, cause we're trying to get posted. I'm not, cause another mistake people make with their deadlift technique is they feel like they need to squeeze their shoulder blades together. Right. Which that, that is not what we're doing. Cause that, that's increasing the range of motion to get to the bar. Right. Not, that that's dis disadvantageous. So what we're really trying to do when we say shoulder blades in your back pocket is to, posteriorly tilt the shoulder blades, you know, set them in place, which then will allow you to activate your last a little bit more efficiently. Um, 
but orange squeezing or making orange juice in your armpits or squeezing orange in your armpit um is is a, it's just a fantastic external cue because you, you tell someone to posteriorly tilt their shoulder blades when it's deadlift they're going to look at you like what the hell are you talking about yeah you're, you're, you're like speaking elvish like <laughs> they don't know what first of all they might not know what a scapula is yeah first of all, when you say posterior tilt they're going to be like huh what? Um, but you tell somebody to i mean they may not even know what their lats are if you say activate your lats they're going to be like what do you mean um but you say squeeze an orange in your armpit and that that accomplishes it automatically and that's going to stiffen your upper, your upper back and you know it's going to make it so you don't round as easily um but yeah all all uh um all that goes to uh compliments of dean somerset <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh i, I will ask him yeah, where he came I can't claim that that's my cue but um <laughs> give uh, credit where credit is due so when I get him on the show someday, I will ask him where he came up with that because yeah. I've always thought that was such a unique. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. So at Cresty Sports Performance on the wall, you guys have an Aristotle quote. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellent, then, is not an act but a habit. Yep. So what habit has been the hardest for you to establish over time? Um, you know, I think from a personal standpoint, um, Probably kind of getting out of my own way as far as uh, um, personal growth and allowing myself to kind of spread my wings a little bit. Um, what's been great about Cressy Sports Performance is as much as my part of my job title is being co-founder of an awesome facility um, and, I've, and being a, an ambassador of that brand, obviously, um, I've also been able to kind of sidestep it to a degree and kind of build my own brand right. with yeah. my own name um with my website and speaking engagements and writing um but with that i mean if you would have done this podcast five six years ago you know i'd have been like i suck you know why why am i on this podcast who wants to listen to me um i don't know what i'm talking about um so part of my growth is a as a coach and as a person has been to, you know, understand that I do have a lot to offer. Um, you know, I, I do have some perspective. Um, people do want to listen to what I want to talk and say and talk about. Yeah. Um, so a lot of that is just kind of turning off the inner noise in, in my head, you know, the negative self-talk, which I think everyone kind of goes through. I think everyone yeah. has that to a degree. Yeah. Hands the down. Talk. Um, but learning to, um, turn it off um, and direct it towards, okay, like good stuff, um, yeah. for lack of a better term. Um, you know, from a coaching standpoint, from an actual like being on the floor coaching athlete standpoint, um, always being mindful that uh, you don't know it all. Um, mm -hmm. You shouldn't, you shouldn't expect to know everything. Um, I feel like that's a, that's a, a, an avenue that a lot of trainers and coaches, particularly new ones, tend to think that I, I need to I need to know everything about everything, um, you know. And it's kind of like the CrossFit mentality, like you're you're average and everything, not great in any one thing, which you know is is cool. But um, as a coach, like I'd rather, and I think many coaches would say this, like you should own one or two or three things, like you're an expert an, an expert in, um, and then build a network of other coaches, other trainers, other physios, doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors that you can refer people to or ask questions of. So, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, take pride in that. I'm always trying to learn and get better. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is when, you know, an uppity trainer will be like, oh, I, I know everything I need to know and I've read every book I need to read, and which sadly does happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just think they're an a-hole when they say something like that. Um, and, uh, I mean, if guys like Dan John and Mike Boyle, who have been doing this for longer than most of us have been alive, can say, hey, I was wrong on this point. Here's what I'm doing to get better. Here's what I've changed. Um, why can't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, and these are guys that are very highly respected and have been doing this for a long time. So, um, so yeah, I mean, as far as uh, – um, habits, you know, just, just making the habit of not thinking I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bigger deal than I am. Like I'm not above learning and getting better. Yeah. 
I every everything you said there, I have suffered from at some point. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I know this. But even even going to the fitness summit and being like, oh my god, like Tony Jindalcore is here and Dean Somerset and Brett Contreras, like all the guys I've read from for all these years, I don't know anything. And sitting halfway through it, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I actually have learned. Like yeah. maybe I shouldn't be so hard on myself. Yeah, I'm the same way. I still get like that. Like I mean, it's, it's hard not to be. It's hard to be in a room with Eric. <laughs> And not feel dumb sometimes. Um, you know, you almost kind of feel like you need a dictionary for Eric, like because he talks so fast. Yeah. Um, I've been around it so long that I, I get it. Like I, I can kind of interpret him. Um, but I can tell you what I've seen the looks of people when they're listening to him, and they're like, like I mean, it's hard to emulate over the camera, but right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I'm like that all the time. Like when I listen to Brett talk, or I listen to even Dean talk. Um, you know, it's cool because I know I'm going to learn. Yeah. Um, you're always going to learn something, but you know, and then it, it can be um, humbling in that you're like, wow, I I am really dumb. <laughs> um, but that's why you're there to get better. I mean, right. That's why you go to events like that. So, yeah. um, you know, so that's that's definitely a step in the right direction. You're going, you're seeking out the right people. So that's good. <laughs> well, that's that's why you know, uh, and and one reason why I started the podcast is. I was like, you know, I want to learn from some of the best, and reading from them is one thing, but you know, interviewing them and chatting with them and and creating that network of like, hey, is it cool if I email you to find out if I'm a complete idiot? Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of kind of does make me feel a, a little bit better. And I have to say, with the for the most part, most 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 people in the industry are very open. Yeah. Um, you email them, they'll email you back. Like I, I make it a personal point to try to answer every email I sent my way. I mean, it might not, it might take me a week or two. But yeah. I usually always answer. Right. Um, you know, I, I I'm I'm saddened when I hear of stories of certain coaches who charge money no matter what um, to talk shop or to have someone come observe them for a day. Um, we have people come to our facility on a weekly basis that come and observe for a day or two, and it's fine with us. Yeah, you know, we don't charge them. You know what we do is we have a um, usually say hey give us ten bucks and we're gonna donate it to this local charity yeah um, and that's I mean most people are more than happy to do that but I've heard stories of like certain coaches charging an arm and a leg just to be in their presence for an hour um, and I find that unfortunate but you know teach his own I guess yeah true true um, all right so a couple of fun questions. Yeah. Uh, we'll stop talk, talking shop a little bit, and we'll we'll talk some uh, some fun things. Um, what's your favorite place to get work done in Boston? Oh man, there's so many. You know, it, it's funny because uh, last fall I went to London, um, and London was great. I mean, it was my first trip to Europe, and yeah. London is obviously that's like a I want to go back. Like I loved it, um, and there I I became obsessed with this coffee shop called Cafe Nero. Um, it's N E R O. So I don't know if it's Nero or Nero or how they say it's an Italian coffee shop. Okay. Um, and they're all over in London. Like it's like a European chain. Yeah. So I came back to this, to the States and with my girlfriend, now wife, and I was talking, I kept talking about this coffee shop, this coffee shop and I don't drink coffee, but I hang out in coffee shops. So like, yeah. you know, like Starbucks and Pete's coffee, whatever. Cause I, I, that's where I like to veg out. Um, and we, I kept talking about it. Like, I'm upset. The ambiance is awesome. It's just a cool, chill area or, or place to just do work and, like, chill out. Um, so then fast forward to, like, this past May or April or whatever, we're walking in downtown Crossing in Boston, and lo and behold, there's a freaking Cafe Nero. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, and it was the first U.S. location um, in Boston. What They brought it to Boston, and there's, there's now four. In, in Boston, and I have to assume they're going to be coming to New York and wherever. But, right. um, but yeah, I mean, uh, my neighborhood right down the street, Panera. Um, you know, Friday nights I go and steal their Wi-Fi. I might do work there. Um, I'm a member of a of a independent movie theater here in my neighborhood called the Coolidge um, that I go to all the time and watch movies and be an uppity movie snob for for uh, <laughs> for a couple of hours. I watch I watch uh, you know foreign film, um, but uh, but yeah I mean I you know I, as a self proclaimed introvert um, you know I need I, my way of re energizing is not being around people, um, kind of, and kind of being in my own head. So coffee shops are kind of coffee shops, bookstores, 
um, are kind of my thing. So, um, but then Lisa and I love, we love going out to eat. So every Saturday night we, we find a restaurant, whether it's a new one or one that we've been to before, we, we go out to eat on Saturday nights. Um, so Boston's a, it's a very cultural city. It um, is. So it's, it's, it's a very cool city to live in, except for this past winter when we got 120 inches of snow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, stuff like that is kind of where I go. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so there is a Star Wars poster behind you. So yeah. I got a few Star Wars questions here. We well, both, I might fail miserably, but yes, go go ahead. We are both very very excited for uh, November. I mean, uh, December eighteenth. Yeah. Uh, I I I'm really surprised that it's June and nothing else has like come out yet about anything. Yeah. Like, I, I'm a little surprised by that. Um, well, I mean, I can't. I, I mean, I've purposely like like cleared myself of, of, of reading any spoilers or plot developments or like pictures. I mean, I, 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 on Yahoo every day I see like, Oh, pictures of so-and-so as, as this character or, uh, you know, plot points revealed. Um, I don't want to know shit. Like I want to yeah. go to the movie and, and like, I want to be immersed in the new vision of what JJ Abrams is going to, is what is going to give us. Um, and certainly when the last trailer came out, when the Avengers came out, um, I mean, I crushed that, but, oh. um, I mean, I have to assume at some point, you know, there's going to be another trailer. Um, but, uh, I mean, I purposely told myself, like, I'm not clicking on any links. I'm not doing anything, uh, until December 18th. Cause I, I want to, I just want to go in with a clean slate, um, and just see what Abram, Abrams comes up with. I, I am confident that it's going to be good because, oh, uh, yeah. Kevin Smith, you know, went and visited the set and he has a whole thing. He did it like Comic-Con last year where he talks about going and he was like, I stepped onto the Falcon and like all of a sudden I was 16 and then I took one more step and I was eight. And he was like, all of a sudden a 40 year old man is weeping oh. with a security guard standing beside him. And he yeah. was like, everything I saw, it is okay. What Abrams is doing. I, uh, I, I, I cried when I watched the trailer. Oh, I did too. As soon as Han opened his mouth, it was done. What are you doing? Like, I'm like, I saw the <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're, we're stepping back to our childhood. Like it's, it's, uh, I, I'm, I mean, this movie's going to make so much money. It's uh, ridiculous. It's so cool because the old cast is in it. Um, yeah. you know, I, I can't wait. Like December 18th can't come soon enough. So we, we've been told that there's not going to be a lot of extended universe stuff. And I, in 2012, when Disney was like, okay, all of the video games, all of the books, that's not canon anymore. I was like, no, 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 no. We old Star Wars fans get to call that canon. The new yeah. Star Wars fans can take whatever Disney wants to feed them. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. who, if, I don't know, I'm assuming you have read some Star Wars books. Who's your favorite extended universe character? You know, honestly, I haven't read any. Oh! Books. Yeah, you caught me. I oh! Have <laughs> I, I have to hand in my nerd card. Shit. Like, <laughs> um, uh, I remember when I was a kid, there, there were a couple, um, uh, extended universe records I listened to that were story that were story plot lines like the Ewoks and okay. um, kind of that kind of stuff. But um, you know, I was never a voracious reader until I got out of college, and even then, like I, I, I really, I, I have not read any Star Wars books. I, that's a that's a fail on my end. <laughs> any any video games you played where you were a different character that maybe you enjoyed? Yeah, no, I was never a big video game guy either. Um, okay. Okay. I didn't. Have, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't play. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I played video games. Right. Um, but when I got to the point where it's like, okay, I need to. I need to be productive with my time. <laughs> um, having a PlayStation Two um, would have been a nightmare. So I, I got right. rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just uh, decided, yeah, I, I didn't play any Star Wars games. So, oh man. Well, I, I, I will admit to listeners right now, I actually did not see Star Wars until I was like eight, and what got me into Star Wars were the Ewok movies, because as a kid, they were like cute little teddy bears. Yeah, I like the Ewoks. Yeah, so that was my first intro to Star Wars were the Ewoks, and then somebody was like, oh, you know they're in another movie. I was like, what? Um, There's like a, yeah, there was another movie, I forgot what it was called, that was like, it was horrible. Um, yeah, it was a little girl, and she like, the yeah. Ewoks, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, December eighteenth, it's 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 go time. 
Oh, I, I've already told my wife, I'm like, I will be there at midnight. I will be at the 3 a.m. Yeah. showing. Yeah, I don't know like, if I can stay. I mean, I, I'm an early to bed guy, so I don't know if I'll, I'll go <laughs> opening night, but I'll definitely go on that weekend. So. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going probably multiple times. Um, all right, so you're also, and, and who isn't really, like, that grew up in the 80s and 90s, a big fan of Schwarzenegger. Oh, yeah. Um, so I got to ask, a little different one, what is your favorite non-action Arnold movie? Non-action Arnold movie. I would have to go with probably Twins. <laughs> good, good choice. Uh, I remember. I I just for some reason remember watching that movie multiple times. Um, because I mean it was just funny to see like Arnold walk into this room all jacked and then see Danny DeVito like, like being Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> and I do remember what the I think it was Kelly Preston. Um, that was Arnold's love interest in that movie and had yeah. a crush on her. So. Um, yeah, I think I'd have to go, I'd have to go with, uh, with twins on that one. Okay. All right. I, I, I like that one. That's a, There's not a lot of like non-action movies. Uh, nah, I had to, yeah. I was like, oh man, am I going to be able to come up with one? But yeah, that's one. <laughs> twins, twins is, uh, is, is like there was jingle all the way, but that was horrible. Well, um, you know, um, that was like the tail end of there like, was one where there was one where he was pregnant. Oh, junior. Uh, oh God. What was it called? Junior. junior? Yeah. Um, and then uh, he's, what? Then kindergarten cop. Yeah, see so yeah, that one would be hard for me just because of you know the famous line. It's not a tumor. Yeah. So twins for me. Okay. All right. I, I like that. It's a good choice. Um, all right. So back to one more Star Wars question. Okay. Um, so let's let's let's. You're we're both big fans. Uh, I am also glad that I'm not the only person who still picks up a stick and pretends that it's a lightsaber, no matter where I go. My wife was like, stop it. Really? We're in public. And I'm like, but it's, I, I have to, I can't help it. Yeah. Uh, so, so who really is far superior, the Jedi or the Sith? No, I'm, I'm a big Darth Maul fan. Yeah. Um, that's, that was by far the best lightsaber. Because you look at the, the fight scenes in the first trilogy compared to the last trilogy, like, the lightsaber skills are, like, it's like night and day. Right, right. Um, like, the original one's like, vroom, vroom, vroom. Yeah. You have Darth Maul coming in, like, twirling shit and, like, throw, like double lightsaber. Like, you're just like, this is awesome. What do um, you think of the new lightsaber, by the way? The weird, like, did you? I, I mean, I know there's a bunch of fanboys out there, like, like yeah. analyzing it. Like, I don't care. Like, it looks cool. It like, looks awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I, I mean, I mean, based on what we've been fed, like you'd have to go with the Jedi cause the Jedi always wins, but the right. Sith, like their moves are sick. Yeah. So, um, and I'm, I'm a big Darth Maul fan. He's my favorite villain. So, oh um, man, if I, if I ever get a chance to come to Boston, I got a, I got a great Star Wars board game. I'd have to let you play with Darth Maul. It's funny. But, like you mentioned, you mentioned like playing lightsaber Yeah. Um, for probably the past six months, maybe eight months. There's been a handful of times where I've come home and Lisa tells me about this random dude that's in the parking lot right out here, like practicing, le legitimately practicing. He has a lightsaber that has sound effects. That's awesome. I mean, he's, a, you could, he's a little bit off. Um, right. And I've never seen him. So, but I did see him, what was maybe like a month ago. I, I pulled, I went in to park my car and he's out there. He's standing out there like doing his light, like walking back and forth with his lightsaber. Um, you know, and it, it was, I wanted to like, you could tell he was a little off. Um, but I, you know, I wanted to like talk to him about Star Wars and I mean, lot, most people's reaction would be to film and make fun of him. Yeah. Um, but I absolutely wasn't. I was like this guy, I mean, he's, he's doing this thing. Like, what? Well, have fun, rock it. Like, yeah. uh, but legitimately it's like full sound effects. Um, it was awesome. Like he's, he's like doing the hand gesture, like, doing <laughs> stuff and, like, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was funny to watch, but uh, but yeah, he was practicing his lightsaber skills straight up. It was it was pretty impressive. <laughs> uh, I'm not I'm not gonna lie. I was the Star Wars kid, like in yeah. my you know that that old video. That was that was me in my in my bedroom. Um, there there is, and I'll, and I'll send you this in an email. There's a website that actually makes custom lightsaber hilts, and you can design it and build it however you want it. Like even like with the crook that like Dooku had, they're pretty baller. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> there, there's a site for everything true true all right so we'll go back to a couple more uh industry questions and then i got a really really great geeky question to end the show okay. with um so you wrote a really great article uh a lot of people it's really hard to deal with stress and the stress of working out the stress of life um you know exercise is a stress on the body as well 
So what do you do to help combat the stresses of life when they happen to you? Um, I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love sleeping. Like, Lisa you know, and I... clock out for 12 hours, like you lay down at 8 a.m. Yeah, it'll be like 9 o'clock. We're like, oh, man, it's 9 o'clock. It's time for bed. Like, um, I just think people don't sleep enough. Yeah. Um, like, turn off your iPhones, turn off your iPads, and go to freaking bed. Um, yeah. You know, me, I mean... Because, like, Lisa jokes about it and that, like, as soon as I'm horizontal, it's, like, game over. Like, I'm not talking. Like, I'm out. Like, it's, like, as soon as my body's horizontal, it's, like, it's like my cue of, like, okay, it's time to shut things down and uh, go to sleep. Yeah. But, I mean, I read before. Like, we, I put the fan on, um, grab my book, and I, I'm, I'm asleep within 10 minutes. Okay. Like, no, no issues at all. Um, I think most people are very hydrated. Um, I think that will help. Yeah. Um, but really anything that's going to, as far as like exercise related, um, I mean, anything that, I mean, cause people will say, well, yoga is great and jogging is great and blah, blah, blah. It's great for stress reduction. Um, but if you don't enjoy doing it, you're not going to get the benefits of it. Right. You know what I mean? So someone like me, I enjoy lifting heavy things. Um, which yeah, you can make the argument is, 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 is additional stress, especially on like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider a day where I'm going in for like, you know, uh, uh 90 to 95% max effort pull as like a, 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 a stress-free day, um, yeah. a stress-free workout or one that's going to reduce my stress level. Yeah. But absolutely going to the gym and lifting weights is a, a form of stress reduction for me because that's something I enjoy doing. Right. Um, I don't enjoy going to yoga. So, um, you know, uh, so I'm not going to reap the benefits of going to a yoga class because, you know, so really when it comes to exercise or meditation, um, it, it, the crucial component of anything that someone chooses is that they actually enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that's going to be the key. So, um, and that's completely individual. Like some people it's meditation, some people it's, you know, going for a run, other people's lifting weights. So, um, you know, that, that's going to be the key is that you're actually going to not only enjoy it, but actually do it. Um, those are going to be the key factors. Yeah. Finding the stress reducer that, that you, like that's for me working out is, you know, a stress reducer, but yeah. I also know of like, if I'm going into doing a very, you know, very heavy day, you know, pulling deadlifts or, or squatting, um, you know, that I've told my wife, I'll tell my wife, listen, if we have to talk about anything, I don't want any stresses. Like as we're about to go to bed, like yeah. go to sleep night, like I need to rest and not yeah. like talk about business or, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's why I think it's important too, to have, uh, your me time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a wife who's very understanding that, you know, if I need to go away for a couple hours to a bookstore, just to kind of be in my own head and kind of do my own thing and not talk. Um, she understands that that's important for me. It's a way for me to re-energize. Like that's mm -hmm. a form of stress reduction. Yeah. Um, some people are the opposite. Like their form of stress reduction is going to a party or going to right. a barbecue or, you know, whatever. Um, so, I mean, different, different people are different, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> different uh, shit is different. <laughs> yeah. That's a quote yeah. Dave Delanova. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that would be my approach is just finding, I think sleep, well, I mean, to me, for anyone, sleep is going to be the determining factor for a lot of people. Yeah. Not enough of it is, is a problem. Problem for, for, They just made a concerted effort to uh, go to bed earlier or make sure, they're, make sure they're getting more sleep or improving the quality of their sleep. Um, that would help. Hey, guys, had to record the last couple of questions here again, thanks to Google Hangout. But anyways, I asked Tony here, what was his... Guilty pleasure track that he has on his workout mix that he would shamefully admit to others he listens to. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, it is Army of Me by Bjork. Yeah, that's uh, that's a guilty pleasure song right there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big, obviously, UDM fan and 90s hip-hop. But, uh, but, yeah, if I had to say if there was any one guilty pleasure song that's on, like, a, a, a playlist of mine, it would be that song. For some reason, I just like the drum beat, and it gets me psyched up, so um, it works. All right, Tony. Mr. Miyagi, Gandalf, and Yoda 
are all in a room, what are they discussing? Oh, man. They're trying to come up with a reason of why people are so obsessed with gluten-free diets. <laughs> 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 like, it's absurd. Like, 99 point whatever percent of the population, does, it doesn't affect us at all, but yet people are eating gluten-free brownies. Like, it's like the, the next be all of health-conscious eating, and it's just absurd. So they would probably be coming up with some kind of, like, talk of, like, trying to philosophize, like, that train of thought. Like, why is that? Outside of someone who actually has celiac disease and an actual gluten intolerance, which is very little people, um, why it's become such a big deal. Hey, guys, speaking of gluten intolerance and gluten-free fads, Tony wrote an article on that that is tagged in the show notes on the website over at sidequestfitness.com backslash podcast. But I gave Tony a little time here to tell you more about where you can find him online. Website is home base. So TonyGeneralCore.com. Um, that's where my blog is, where my articles are, where my services are. Um, that's, that's my home base newsletter. Um, so yeah, everything's right there. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that episode. Head over to TonyGeneralCore.com to check out more from Tony. And stay tuned for more great episodes coming up this summer.